Hello, innovators. I am Dustin Miller, Poly Innovator. Today we're talking with Elena Agararagimova, the founder of Bloom Youth, the first MENA future of education platform made for students to accelerate their talents, co founder of Bercern.co, the first Middle Eastern digital platform that helps corporates support their employees' productivity and well being. And then on top of that, a career development consultant, a talent development specialist with 10 years of experience, TEDx speaker, an author, and education advocate. Thank you for joining me on the Polymath Polycast. Thank you. You make me sound really good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I always say, if I run out of breath doing that intro, it makes me really happy. <laughs> so I know it's going to be a good episode. You believe that, you can, that through education and technology, we can make learning accessible and available for all. And so I'm really excited to go into that with you today. This is a show by Poly Innovators, so please say hello to the innovators in the audience. Hi, innovators. Uh, really, really good to have you, to be here with you guys, actually, and hoping you get some interesting stuff out of this conversation. Hello and welcome to the Polymath Polycast. Well, and I'm sure I have a lot of educators in my audience as well. Some of my people even are rebel educators as they would be called. And so I think it's going to be really entertaining for a lot of them too. Amazing. Let's do it. So we're here to talk about the future of education, future careers, especially as a jack or jill of all trades. One thing I like to do to break the ice is to have you share something about yourself that no one knows about you. Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> You're just going <laughs> to throw that one in there. Yeah. <laughs> Um, gosh, um, okay, well, here's something I don't share often. I, so people know me as a very sort of optimistic, positive, outgoing person. That wasn't always the case. I used to be the most shy, introverted, negative, completely insecure, etc. person. So, mm. and not many people know that because of my personality now, but uh, yeah. I don't know. So that's something, I guess. Yeah, you have this bubbly and lively personality now. And I'm wondering, too, is sometimes people need to go through that elevation, they, uh, not elevation, evolution, to really kind of become who they need to be in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think it's one of those things where, you know, through certain life experiences, you, I guess, at the end of the day, you have a choice. And that's what I believe in. At the end of the day, we have a choice. And at some point when you are, when you find yourself, like in my case, I found myself at a moment in life where I didn't have great people around me. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I wasn't doing, I was really unhappy in various aspects of my life from personal to professional. I was just really like a lost soul, if you want to call it. But I think everybody goes through that, to be, and to be fair. But I went into a very negative mindset. And part of that comes from... Uh, being abroad in Russia where it's all doom and gloom and mm -hmm. so that's a very you know in, in Russia it's a very like we, we we don't talk enough about the great things that are happening we talk a lot about things that are just bad you know yeah. and that's just a cultural thing and so so growing up in that it was kind of already embedded in me like to see like the the bad side of everything and then so at some point I, I realized I was like well this is happening and I wonder why this is happening and I wonder if it's about me and I'm like oh yeah it's actually it's because like I'm I'm allowing these things to happen I'm allowing to have these people in my life I'm attracting these situations and experiences like that's on me and so mm -hmm. the minute I've kind of I mean, then it took me a few years to actually do something about that. But the awareness, that kind of seed was planted. And I remember I was sitting, I don't know, maybe in my early 20s or something. I was sitting at a friend's house at a time and I was looking around the room. I was like, wow, I was like, I really don't belong in this room. Like, this is, this cannot be my, like, this cannot be my circle, you know, yeah. not to say anything bad about anybody. But like, you just find yourself and you're like, I, that's, I don't want this. I don't want this to be my future, mm -hmm. basically. So, so, yeah. Well, they say you're the average of your five closest friends or five closest people. And if those yep. people aren't really the greatest, it's going to make you not as great as you could be. Absolutely. Yeah, I, com I completely, completely believe this. It's better to be alone than in bad mm. company. And I did spend yeah. a few years just very isolated um, kind of to myself. I mean, I was, all, you know, I was kind of seeing people from time to time, but I was spending a lot of time alone. Well, and so your past was more introverted and you're a little bit more extroverted now. Do you still get your energy from introverted things like being along your own reading books or do you get your energy from people and talking? Kind of a little bit of both, I guess. I mean, I do need my alone time. So I'm still like, I mean, because of my work, I have to be this extroverted person. I very much enjoy it, but it also very much drains me. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, you know, being alone is, is, is great and I love that. But then I also really enjoy having these sort of conversations that are yeah. just really, I love it. Like it gives me energy, you know, so... I'd say a little bit of both. It seems interesting too, because the way you were speaking reminds me of stoicism. And you said before that you recently got into the stoic art of living. So how has that changed your life? Yeah. So, um, I've gotten into this. I don't know. I, 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 I saw something about the stoicism journal, um, on social media a while back. 
And I was like, this is interesting. Let me look into that. And then I, I read something by Tim Ferriss, who was talking about mm. stoicism. So he's really big on that. And I, I really enjoy all his content. And so I said, okay, let me, let me just get into it. So I bought this journal and it's basically every week you have a different theme that sort of sets you, it's, it's a theme that sets you in for the day. So, uh, so I started uh, this Stoicism journal and I've, I've been following Tim Ferriss for quite some time. And this is something that he very much uh, talks about. So I said, let me give this a try. It sounds interesting. So basically what, what this journal does is it has like themes for every week. So every week there's a theme that kind of sets your, you know, like, for example, I don't know, the, the theme of, you know, empathy, for example, or like not, you know, not being judgmental, giving people benefit of a doubt, etc. So it gives you like this kind of preset of the theme for the week. And then every day in the morning and in the evening, it asks you questions. And the questions could be like, what, what thoughts have you had about other people today that might, that might be stopping you from, I don't know, uh, being empathetic or something like it's mm -hmm. just like the most you know random questions but they're not really random you know they're just really deep really philosophical that re literally stop you in your tracks and the reason i started doing that is because i tend to be a person who just on the go all the time and i'm really trying to to practice being a little bit more grounded having t having really that time to sit down and kind of devote to journaling and and that really helped me so i do some free freestyle kind of writing but mm -hmm. also, um, uh, or free flow, whatever you call it, I don't know. Uh, or, 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 and, and then I do this journal where it's this preset of questions that really get me to think about certain topics that I just never thought about. So it's more of just my aim to become more and more self-aware because I think it's a continuous journey. And so I found Sto the, the Stoic journal is quite interesting for that. Yeah. Is it close to like bullet journaling, that kind of thing, or no? Is it just different? I don't know what that is, the bullet journal. Bullet journaling is a type of journaling that people do. So it's, it's a pretty common self-development kind of habit people have. I'm I'm sure that it's probably a similar habit, but the actual outcome of it's probably different than the Stoic journal. But regardless, it's still interesting though, and if it gets you thinking in a unique way, that's awesome. Yeah, I have it right here. See, it's on my desk. Always. Yeah. It's by Ryan Holiday. Yeah, yeah, I've heard the book. I think. Yeah, so it's it's quite it's quite a thing. Like uh, I I really I would highly recommend to anybody who is interested to kind of take go to the next level of self-awareness i guess and start thinking about things you don't think about and that's the thing right we don't know what we don't know and mm -hmm. that's that that's why you know even like like some of the things that you're doing and, and, and i know you produce a lot of content that's amazing but it's like it's, it's about being continuously curious and that sparks your mm -hmm. curiosity because we don't know what we don't know and until we're ex exposed to certain questions certain conversations like how can we learn so, mm -hmm. and, and that's what we practice in our business and that's what I practice in my life. And so I just say, okay, like I need to keep doing it. Like I need to take it to the next level. So I found it really helpful for that. Yeah. Well, and indulging your curiosity is very important. I think one of my other guests, Dave Burris, he was talking about how curiosity is a skill. You have to cultivate it. You have to work towards it. And people like Da Vinci or Franklin and all these amazing innovators and Ada Lovelace and all these great minds they indulged in their curiosity. They went after it and they built it up. And that's mm -hmm. why they're known for such great things because they were able to do so many different things from that like curiosity to learn and do new more. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and I like it that, that he mentions that it's a skill because it's like, you have to make time for it. And that's what I've known. This is literally why I got this journalist because not to spend a lot of time on it, but because you get so caught up and you need to make time for certain things and, you know, mm -hmm. find ways. And, and this is like five to 10 minutes every morning and then the evening. So like micro small ways to engage yeah. your mind, right? Like it doesn't have to be this huge thing. And so, so that's, yeah, so that's one way to kind of create a skill around curiosities, these sort of things. Yeah. And it makes me think of macro and micro focus. It was one of my favorite Fireside Micro Podcast episodes I made like oh, a long time ago, actually, at this point. But I talk about the things you need to do on a daily and hourly basis. And then there's also the things you need to do on a quarterly and yearly basis. And mm -hmm. understanding how both of those interact with each other, the habits that you're doing is very mm -hmm. important. And I, I remember being, I think I said this on the last <laughs> episode too, but I remember being uh, like five years ago, six years ago, 2015, and I'm like sitting there like, I want to do all these different habits. I want to do Duolingo so I can learn more languages and meditation and exercise and uh, taking courses and reading and all these, <laughs> eating well, <laughs> all these different habits. And I'm like, how do I incorporate it into my daily life? And I couldn't visualize it. But over time, with this consistent practice of doing habits, I built up the habits and now they can come and go if they need to. And they're small enough to where it doesn't take up a whole bunch of my day. Absolutely. And the, the, the beautiful part about that is that you can stay consistent. 
You know, mm -hmm. and that's the thing people don't get about habits, right? Is that, you know, we, when we look at doing some kind of change, whether it's career change or, I don't know, healthy eating, we say, I'm going to drop everything. I'm going to just going to focus. I'm going to study. I'm going to take this certification, this degree. I'm going to start working out five times a week. I'm going to, you know, cut all the sugar out of my mouth. It's, it's too much for us. It's too much, depending mm -hmm. on which level you're at, right? And in, in, in that, in, in these dimensions. But it's too much change for your brain, essentially. Mm -hmm. And that, this is something we talk about in Best Learn a lot is, that's how the, our whole methodology is. How can we help people learn in micro habit creation way um, mm -hmm. that's been proven and tested by science? And a lot of uh, a lot of research came out and say, listen, if you just break things down to small little achievable things like daily, like five minutes, ten minutes, like it doesn't have to be an hour, or two hours, like a five minute walk will add up to 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 then like you know hours and hours of work walking, and then eventually that five minute walk is going to turn into a ten minute walk. Right, etc. So, so I think so I, I agree. I think that's a beautiful way to create new habits. Um, and if you've you've kind of cracked that, that's that's great because that's it's it, it helps with consistency and discipline. Yeah. Well, and from what I understand, you're doing it well as well too. And it, I think I remember hearing you say something about doing like exercise or doing stuff every day on, on one other kind of podcast. And there's two ways of change like that, dramatic change especially. And like you're saying, the micro doing a consistent compound effect every day. That's probably the best way to go about it and it's literally just consistent practice doing a little bit just the other day i wanted to meditate and i bought my uh meditation thing outside so i could sit outside and breathe and have the fresh air and i sat down only did it for about two minutes and then mm -hmm. left and i was like you know i didn't fail because I, I came out here and did it even if i didn't do it for long i did it exactly even if you would have came out and like just put the pillow or whatever you want to sit on like that's enough like you know what i mean because next time you're going to come and next time you're going to sit and that's and I think that's important to recognize we're, we're so focused on like, you know, like intense Completion. change and like, yeah, yeah, like, you know, like it needs to be this, this massive things. It doesn't, it really like, who's, who's, who's counting, like how much, you know what I mean? It's between you and you at the end of the day, like whatever helps you progress, like whatever process works for you, like that's where it's at. And I remember getting into a rabbit hole one day on YouTube. I don't remember the school of life, some, some kind of YouTube channel. Can't remember off the top of my head. It was interesting because he talked about radical change, like radical life changed. And some points when people hit their lowest point, they're most open to change. That's a quote from one of my favorite shows, uh, The Legend of Korra. And it talks about like when you are in a dramatic situation where you have nothing like to lose, like, you can't hit any more rock bottom, then you're most open to new change. And so the most radical life changes as well. So you can do all those little micro habits because you have no other choice. You're doing mm -hmm. all those different things, but those are a very rare circumstance. The only other way, if you're not in that low state to do it is by doing these micro habits and doing mm -hmm. them over and over and over again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I always, I always feel like in order for us to achieve anything, it's just about consistency and discipline. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> excuse me and micro habits help you be consistent and disciplined and that like i really feel like that's that because usually people don't achieve something because they give up or it's too hard yeah. or it's too much it's too big etc so breaking it down always works yeah and so another thing i wanted to ask you is what was your mindset five years ago and how have you changed since then mm. great question i mean looking back so that so i've i so in 2014, I moved to Dubai. So I've been there in Dubai for seven years. So at that point, I've just, I've just sort of just a couple years fresh. I've just sort of settled in into Dubai, took like a year, two years to really make it feel like home. And also, to be honest, I mean, life happened at that point. I went through a divorce at that time as well. So mindset definitely changed from somebody. Well, I mean, we just took it, take it from a personal perspective, somebody who had a certain idea about certain, I don't know, relationships in life that were no longer there. So I think on a personal level, a lot of that changed, right? Mm -hmm. Because you realize you're like, okay, now it's just me. Like, you know, you were sold this idea of marriage, right? And then, and then it's like, and then it's over. And then you're like, oh, it's just me. So that took a mindset shift because you're like, okay, what am I going to do with my, like, what should I be doing now? Like, right. To, 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 to I don't know, to, to be successful, whatever that means. And, and another part of it was professionally speaking. So I, I left the US, of course, I came to Dubai, I didn't have a job in the beginning. Um, it took me some time to find it. So it was like really life changing in terms of, okay, now I kind of have this clean slate. So what do I do mm. with that? So it went from like, everything was going kind of the way society and, you know, family and stuff, everybody expected it to go, you know, married, et cetera, kind of settling down, you know, these sort of things to, to then like all of that went away. And then on top of that, I didn't have my, I, I had my career in the US, but I haven't yet entered the UAE market to kind of have that career. So it was, it was, yeah. it was quite, so I don't know if it's answering your question. I mean, mindset wise, like it was, it's just two different worlds. 
you know, to different worlds um, in terms of how I thought about myself, how I thought about my relationships, my, um, you know, where I was. I mean, I was in a new country, uh, didn't really know anybody. Like, so it's, it's a great question. I, I, I don't have a specific I answer. Well. Yeah, I don't know if I have you specific should. answers, but yeah. You're com all your environments changed, your home, your life, your personal, your work, everything changed so dramatically, so quickly. And I appreciate you sharing that with me too. I, I noticed in one of your recent videos, you started sharing more of your personal life and we talked about this, your marriage and your divorce. And then on top of that too, I remember you, I don't know what show this is on, but you shared a, a story about how like in Russia, if you're not married by 25, yeah, and you're just an old lady, like you, <laughs> you're you just gonna are. be a maid or something like that. <laughs> It's a true story. Like, you know, yeah, maybe it's changing, but it, it's it's a true story. It's just how it is. And it's a cultural thing. And it's just, it is what it is. And it's a very, I mean, it's a patriarchal society, very much so. Um, a lot, you know, statistically, there's a lot more women than men in Russia. Um, mm -hmm. It's also an economical thing, of course, uh, in places like Russia. So it's, um, it's, a, it's um, I mean, we're quite traditional, I guess, in that sense. So we're quite traditional when it comes to family and things like that. And yeah, but it's just, and, and I think it's great for whoever chooses that, but our culture tends to kind of demonize anybody who's like above 25, like, oh, you're doing something wrong. Like, really, like, that's, the, that's, that's how it is. Like, you know, you're like, oh, you must be doing, something must be wrong with you, right? Um, so, so culturally, even like my divorce, it was like such a failure, like in, 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 in many eyes of like, you know, family and stuff like that. Yeah, so, so I, I think being okay with that. So if I were to go back to that question, saying that my mindset change is that it's okay to change your mind. <laughs> like that yeah. was one of the biggest, like, there's nothing like I made a decision and then I didn't want it anymore. Like, you know, so it's, it's okay to change your mind. Like just do you. And I wasn't like, I wasn't about like focusing on what does Elena want? I was more of like, how does everybody else look at me? How is this going to reflect? Like, I didn't even tell people I was divorced for a while. Like I was embarrassed. Yeah. I'm like, oh man, like, because it was such a bit, it was such a, such a nice story, et cetera, et cetera. You know, like he's a great guy. We just, we just were better friends than we were husband and wife, you know, like nothing, yeah. nothing, nothing against at all but it was just like you know you just get to a point you're like maybe this wasn't such a great idea and i think having the courage to be like check please you know what i mean <laughs> and having the <laughs> self-awareness <it> too <laughs> exactly so big self i think self-awareness is the is the like the base of it all everything it's about self-awareness because when you start to realize like when you when you look in the mirror you're like i'm where i am because of my choices because of certain things that I've done, like we, I really believe like we, we have a choice on many, many things in our life. So if you're not happy with a particular area, you should probably take a look at the mirror and that's the hardest mm -hmm. part. And the, the next hardest step is like, what do I do about it now? And how do I like, how do I move forward now that I'm, I'm, I'm aware of my own BS, like what's next, you know? And that's the difficult part because this is when you're going to lose relationships, friendships, you know, etc. of people that are close to you, um, your whole mindset changes. And then with that, your whole environment changes. Um, and it's, it's a beautiful thing, but it's also scary and uncomfortable. So, yeah. When you got to cut out some things in your life too, even if you enjoy them, even if you like them in your life, you had to cut it out. So focus on what you need to do next. <clears throat> yeah. Well, and it, it reminds me, I was on a show recently called screw the stigma and it was, a, it's an awesome podcast. And it just made me think about that. Like you're a powerful woman. You can screw the stigma, do your own thing, empower yourself, empower others with the work that you do. Uh, if, if, if I come off like that, great. <laughs> That's what I feel. <clears throat> and considering you were doing, yeah, look, consider you were doing like tons of corporate events and speaking engagements a little over a year ago. How have you adapted then since quarantine? Yeah. So definitely we, we, we went full digital. Um, we were already sort of, so our whole kind of um, business model is around like online micro delivery, you know, access to uh, our whole thing. We wanted to make learning and uh, learning and coaching accessible and affordable for all like under best friend, right? So this is where we said, how can we incorporate technology to make this? So not everybody is able to afford, you know, a coach two, three hundred dollars to come in, et cetera, right? Or for companies even to invest the kind of money to bring trainers and, ex you know, executive coaches, et cetera, to kind of onboard. There's a lot of there's a lot of um, expense that goes into uh, into that. So we were we've been kind of shifting towards it. That that was our whole aim. But the market wasn't quite ready for it. So for us, it was like a silver lining because we're like, oh, yes, finally, like it took a pandemic for us, for, for the companies to be like, oh, there's another way to do this. Or, oh, our people can be productive and still get things done. Or, yeah. oh, our people are really resilient. And actually, we, we can really pivot and adapt, et cetera. So, so yeah, so we've just taken it to online. But again, it's our approach is very micro learning. Uh, we, we don't do a lot of 
We don't do more than like an hour, an hour and a half uh, online sessions and stuff like that. So it's quite uh, incorpor like it's a hybrid model between live, our access to our app and individual interactions on the app where people can chat with a coach anytime, anywhere. Hmm. Well, and you kind of explained it there, but it might be helpful for you to explain Blessern and uh, Blessern and Bloom Youth. Yeah, Just sure. To so um so bestern is um it's a it's a it's a tech solution basically um where we so we're actually sponsored by the uh, abu dhabi government so we're selected as one of the startups to help create solutions that can promote productivity and well-being in the workplaces um mm -hmm. uae is brilliant at these sort of things they have a whole ministry it's called ministry of happiness and um well-being um mm -hmm. uh, that works very hard to create these sort of solutions so we're we're we got really lucky uh, to be supported by uh, by the entity and so we've created a solution essentially that helps employees learn so it's all about upskilling we focus a lot on on soft skills leadership skills but the the methodology it's, is what's unique so it's not something we came up with it's something that we've researched and we've kind of taken different methodologies from like bj fogg for example uh, a, a professor at stanford who developed the whole habit um, habit creation uh, methodology there's also a lot of research on neuroscience and how it affects with how people learn, you know, mm -hmm. like attention spams, like different styles of learning. How do you actually engage people? How do you keep them engaged in, a, in an online learning environment? And how do you, on top of that, how do you get them to be motivated to learn? And so we've created individualized journeys for people in organizations where they can work on different dimensions of their well being. So that could be your career well being, that could be your financial well being, that could be your emotional well being, et cetera. And then it's basically like a customized, um, a uh, customized platform for them that they can learn live set in live sessions followed by those micro learning opportunities on their own time with some activities that take five to ten minutes of their day and then on top of that they have access to a human being because that's a big big part of of, of our growth like we need to have a conversation we need a bouncing board um, so so they they can access a coach uh, via chat and app yeah, having that personal touch, I think, is very important. Uh, with my own modular degree, even, I thought about using AI and having technology behind it, but in order to interpret that AI, uh, like recommendations and that kind of thing, you need to have a person, like a mentor there, yeah. to help that learner understand what they, why they need to do that particular pathway or something like that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and that, that's that's very important. And um, technology is great, but we don't we don't you know we're not a we're not some kind of training provider in that sense. We are you know we we are a technology a tech solution essentially. Yeah. But we we don't discredit the fact that the human touch is very important. That's what that's one of our kind of distinguishing aspects around us is the fact that they can have a live support person that normally they won't be able to afford or the company would not even sort of sponsor because it's that's that's how it is in companies most of the time they or usually hire coaches for like the topic is executives so like or you know the, the high potential but it's not the high potential that needs the coach it's the it's the it's the rest of the people who who have the potential but they don't they need a little bit more support so that's where it should be invested and again with tech it makes it affordable and accessible scaling it up too and i love what you're doing there because it seems like you're able to change the way we approach education in the corporate world and or even just in business in general and we need that we need more and more unique ideas when it comes to education because we've kept this university kind of stead in stone four year only degree so that kind of thing or two years at the very least in this very long and hard doing it pathway it's like mm. that's, how, that's the only pathway we've had and now that with the internet we have these this advent of this new technology we need to be able to use it and but we have to be creative as a society and people like what you're doing there in order to change how we approach education mm. yeah and actually i'm gonna throw that back at you because you're also doing some amazing things in, <laughs> in the module and i want to hear about that i want to talk a little bit about that because i really think that this whole you know self you know self-created curricular so to say um, is really going to be the future. It's not. It's it's going to be an alternative way. And as there, there's perhaps already something like that out there, you, you would know more than I do. But I I think that you know the traditional higher education system is. It, I mean, it's it's there to stay. It's it's a, it's a dinosaur. It's going to it's going to you know it's it's been around for too long for it to go and still going to be true. But I find that many many smaller universities and colleges um are just going to i mean many of them probably already did shut down as a result of uh, last year yeah. but i think a lot more are going to become I almost irrelevant and they and, mm. and and as the is the gen z uh, graduating and coming into the workforce and we have other other uh, generations coming up and looking at how the world of work is changing like is anybody going to want to go to a four-year degree i don't know maybe 
you know, but I don't know, but, but I think there's going to be a whole lot of people that are like, eh, not for me. Let me look at alternative options. Like, let me learn what I want to learn. So I'm curious to hear, because I know you're doing some things around that. Yeah. Well, and you, you made a good point that I was actually going to bring up is that a lot of these universities not more and more so the colleges, so to speak, are closing down because of what happens. And I think it's kind of a good thing because it's kind of one of those things where you cut out the fat, so to speak, and the ones that stay are going to be the more either higher quality ones or the ones that make the most money. But either way, it's it's starting to become more of an isolated thing. And so that way there's room for growth in other ways. And so, yeah, I created the modular degree system in order to be that new way of approaching education. I see it as an alternative to schooling, but I think that it also could be a replacement in some way as well. This really depends on how people use it. And I think particularly through the online medium as well, because we have all this online resources, YouTube videos, courses, MOOCs, uh, whether it's micro credentials or just single MOOCs themselves, and then podcasts and audiobooks and all these materials. But how do you organize that? How do you go about learning those things? And, and especially in a like macro and micro way, like focus, how mm -hmm. do you actually get those habits into them? And so it's interesting how it's a freedom of choice philosophy. And I'd like to get your opinion on the whole idea behind how does someone curate their education in a modern world? What do you think in your mind? So I, I think education, one, it's very personalized, right? Or it should be. It should be very individualized. I think that we need to really move away. And I guess we all, we, we're doing this in some, some aspects, some universities are doing it, where we need to move away from like, Let's get this general like business administration degree, which is, do you know that business administration statistically is still one of the most popular degrees for undergraduate study? Isn't yeah. that ridiculous? Like no offense to anybody who's done, a, who's done a business degree, but I'm just saying like, like, yes, there's, so university is not just about the degree. It's also the social aspect and that's for sure. Like that is there, right? But if we're talking about just curricular, like a lot of the courses that we take in universities, like in the States, for example, right? The first year or two years. So a lot of the university studies, so the first like couple of years of, well, like at least the first one or two years, if I remember correctly, it's quite general studies. Like we're taking a lot of things that we're never going to use realistically. And like, it's nice because you, you know, you, you need to be this well-rounded person, but we cannot afford to spend time on things that are simply not adding to our future careers, right? So, and that's, that's, so if I'm, when I think of future of a future of, you know, what do we study or how does the future of work look like? And how's the future of education? And it needs to be personalized. And, and surely there's responsibilities of three parties, which I like to talk about. So there's the individual, the mm -hmm. institution, and then the corporations. So, and so there's three, three responsible parties really, but we as individuals, what we can focus on is our own self. So looking at whatever it is that you want to do in your career and you're like, whatever's interesting to you and then future focus it, mm -hmm. right? So looking at, okay, I want to be, I don't know, a marketeer, or I want to be a, I don't know, I want to go into uh, uh, information technology, right? And then from like, start with the basics of like, what is it that I look for? And then looking at how can I get there? And that's the thing that a lot of people um, kind of miss because traditionally it's normal. Okay. You graduate from high school, you get into university, you study, and then you look for a job with a big name. And, yeah. and it's very limiting, like it's very limiting. There are so many different ways to do what, whatever that you know, the person wants to do. There's so many different ways. So it starts with that self-awareness, like what is it that I, that I want to do? How can I find this information? Like being curious, right? Mm -hmm. So getting that, you know, talking to people, right? Getting information basically. And, and again, we don't know what we don't know, right? So trying to be resourceful in that way. And then kind of looking at, okay, how, what does that look like? What does this job look like by the time I get this degree, for example, right? And a lot of times by the time right now, the way the system is set up, by the time you graduate, if all the student is doing is taking a four year degree, according to the study, maybe a few extracurricular activities, maybe an internship here and there, they're already behind. Because by the time they graduate, they, yeah, they, they, they're already behind. Um, so and I think that experience, like if you're great at what you do, the chances are not many companies are going to really care if you have that degree unless you're going into like the corporates who are who want you to have that mba who want you to have that bachelor if you're brilliant at what you do and you have a backup of experience to say this is what i do you have your portfolio or your personal brand right mm -hmm. yeah so like if you have the the like this is it like this is my portfolio of work whatever it is like if you're able to show that i can imagine that more and more companies are going to be like that's all right let's just you know you can come on board you know etc um 
again, it depends, but I think that that's going to be happening more and more. And especially with like recent announcements, what we've seen with many companies that are saying, listen, you know, if you're great at um, coding, you don't really need to have this degree. Like, because at the end of the day, yeah. like <laughs> if you can code, if you're just an amazing coder or you're like, you're just really into cybersecurity and you're just great at what you do and, and you can get the job done mm -hmm. as like, as a company, I don't know, as a, as a CEO of some company is, you know, he or she going to be like, oh, but they don't have a degree. I doubt it. They're going to yeah. be like, can this person do the job? Yeah. Like, do they have the experience? Yes. You know what I mean? So, so well, I think that, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, like, I think even on your TED talk, you talked about how, like, uh, being able to just like talk your way into getting a job, because if you look at your CV, there's a lot of different listings on there. And most people like, for some reason, all these companies are using these automated CV and resume re scanners. And if there's a, no degree, they throw it out. If there's a ton of listings on the jobs or experience, they throw it out because they're like, we want someone who's specialized. But it's it's like those things where you're not actually looking at that person. You're not seeing if they're actually good for that role. And I remember one day, I, I like anytime I go to a new bar or something like that, I went there for salsa and I went around talking to everybody. I, I introduced myself to the bartender, the, the front person, the DJ. And I literally just approached the DJ, shook hands, introduced myself. And the, just that interaction, the gregariousness impressed him so much that a week later he hired me to go work for him and it was just one of those things where I think that if you can really present yourself in person like you can that like that's also a very important aspect yeah I think those relationships are very important um at the end of the day and uh, absolutely I mean look like you can yeah like I always say like you can have the best cv in the world but if nobody knows about you like it becomes very difficult so like it's great it's important to have a good marketing active like tool as your cv beautiful and in my case my cv was so all over the place it doesn't no matter what I do with it and I mean I I, I sometimes I help people with their cvs and I can tell you like I struggle with my cv because mm. because after I mean I've been working since I was 15 like my first job was, was at subway which you know right so like I've done so many different jobs and I cannot put all the experience, the, the kind of learnings that I've had, the, the pure customer customer service experience, which translates to my ability to then sell, to do marketing, mm -hmm. to do business development. Like, do you get what I'm saying? Like all of those experiences are so rich in their own small, like in their own way. And no matter yeah. how, no matter what, how small the job was, even if it's like waitressing for like I did waitressing for a while, you know, like being able to talk to just about anybody that's a skill but as a and and, and that's a, a lot of people miss that skill communication public speaking is one of the biggest concerns for many professionals this is like one of the top re, uh, top trainings that people go for you know so if you have that ability right and then you have the business knowledge and the industry knowledge like you're probably a great candidate but to be fair to the hr people and people that are screening cvs it's simply they don't have they do not have the capacity to be able to do that. And on top of that, sometimes people sitting reading those CVs don't understand how to spot potential. They don't know yeah. how to ask the right questions. They don't know how to get the information. They don't, you know what I mean? So they have to go through that tick in the box because they simply don't know how else to do it. Again, technology is beautiful for that. So there's there, there's a lot of AI, um, uh, AI programs that are available that are going to help um, uh, you know, companies evaluate individual beyond just their tick in the box CV, but more on their behavioral uh, style, right? So how they present, how they speak, the tone of their voice, the gestures on the on the calls, etc. So the the kind of uh, answers they give, how you know their body language, all of that. So there is technology that does that, and some companies are doing it more, using it more and more to sort of um, instead of the the automated uh, tracking system, applicant systems. Yeah, well, and considering from your start at Subway, uh, 17 careers, uh, not careers, but jobs later, you have this diverse work experience. You're a multi-potentialite and someone to potential to do many different things. I also worked over half a dozen different employers with over a dozen different jobs myself. At one point, I held six to eight positions at once. And yeah, it was, yeah, it was exciting. It's the thing, it was one of my positions I even held was just an elevator operator. And like you said, being able to communicate with people. I didn't think of it like a high quality job. I didn't think of it like, oh, it's going to make me a high standing member of society. I'm pushing buttons and saying hi to people. But it was enjoyable. I was able to interact with people and actually make them feel better on this short little elevator ride that way. And that's a skill, yeah. like you said. And so what do, you, what do you think we can do as people who do many different things to present ourselves to others, like in the way of a CV or just a presentation or a personal brand, whatever it may be? 
it, 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 and again, it, it would depend, right? So depending on kind of which industry. So there are, I have to say that there are certain industries, certain professions that prefer you to be a little bit more specialized, mm-hmm. right? So, but those are, those are, those are niche kind of areas, you know, I don't know, maybe like your NASA engineer or like, I don't know, a specific kind of doctor, but even in those cases, like even in like, for example, like take an example of a doctor. Yeah. They want you to be specialized, but you also need to be pretty good with tech. You need to be able to do tele, tele communication. You need to be able to, uh, to use the technology, the application that whatever, you know, your hospital, like here, for example, uh, I'm using, um, I uh, forget the company name, but uh, I love their app. They have an application. So it's a medical application mm. um, and, and you can chat. They send you all the messages. And this is most hospitals have adapted that. But I love how proficient and kind of on point the doctors are when you're communicating with them. Like they're they're really spot on with their communication. And, and that's a skill to be learned. And many people who've never had to use that technology probably have to learn it. But anyway, so there are a few where you can, need to be a little bit more focused, of course. But for many, many jobs... Um, you know, number one, I guess it would be to, to have some kind of portfolio. And I think that's important. And I was telling you earlier, like, I loved your website. I think you've done such a great job with putting so much content that is so relevant, uh, in different areas, right. From the, from like innovation to entrepreneurship, to careers, et cetera. So, I, so having some kind of, you know, tracking, what is it that you're doing, not just for the, for the personal brand, but just for yourself to track your achievements, I think is important. I think uh, what I'm hearing a lot lately in the, at least in the coaching world is that people are like, Oh, you need to be, you need to be niche. Like you need to find a niche. Like, yeah, maybe, maybe you need to find a niche, but at the same time, like, how do you, if you, if you have to ask that question, if you don't know what your niche is, you probably haven't mm-hmm. tried enough things to be like, what do I really want to, where, where's my real strength? Like, you know, it comes naturally. So, so I think experimenting with as many things as possible is great. And then to be able to pr- portray that, you need to have a very clear, you need to be, you need to understand what is it that you represent. And sometimes it doesn't have to be like, I can do X, Y, and Z. Sometimes it's the mission that you're on, on mm. right? So the mission is to, let's, I don't know, in our case, like mission is to to to, to kind of transform the way people are, 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 are looking at education, looking at future of work, right? And what we do is we use all of these different tools to make that happen. So that's one way, instead of saying, I can do this, this, and this, no, like I'm on a mission to do A, and in order for me to do that, I'm using X, Y, and Z and A, B, and C, and D to make that happen. So, mm-hmm. but the, the mission, the, the sort of the, the vision and the mission of what you're trying to put out into the world is one thing. Mm-hmm. And I think when you present yourself in that way and then saying, and by the way, I do this using all of these different tools and kind of skills that I have, that makes it a much clearer story. But you need to be able to say that to yourself. Like you mm-hmm. need to be able to have it clear of how you got there. Like how, how, did you, how did you get to where you are? And then also have a portfolio that represents that. And again, this is where your website is brilliant because Thank it's you. just, it's, um, I love it. Yeah. Share it. I, uh, well, and it makes me think too, like I created Poly Innovators an umbrella and then for a foundation for all the different careers I want to have. And each of those careers will be different phases for it as well. And so that way, that why that you're mentioning, that, that single focus is one of those phases. And so over time, I can explain it as that one focus. And you made me think too about how specialist like, things we've lived in a specialist society for only about a hundred years. Before that, a lot of people were more generalist. And I think it's uh, one thing I've been trying to do with my content and the show, especially, is try to exemplify the fact that human nature is to be more generalist. And the fact that, like, yes, we have these specialties as lawyers or doctors, but even as doctors, you have to have many different skills, like you were saying. I interviewed Ali Abdal, who was a uh, junior doctor across the pond, and as well as he ta- he built an app, like with coding knowledge. He developed a personal brand and He's a polymathic doctor, if you will. And it's also interesting too, that like, if you're a doctor who knows coding, that is a big dual specialty. That's really, like, as you know, it's like very important right now. There's a lot of apps that can only really be developed in the medical world by doctors, because you need someone with that knowledge of how it works in that environment. And the same thing goes for lawyers who need to have different personal branding aspects or different interactions with civil engineering, that kind of thing. Like how does law go into urban development? How does law go into various other fields as well? And on top of that, the T-shaped marketer, all these different aspects to just being a specialist, you still need to have a generalist background as well. 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think that we, we just, I think whatever, you know, whoever's listening, whatever they're doing in their careers, I would always ask like, what is the future in your particular area industry job looks like and how are you going to fit into that? Mm -hmm. Because we get so busy um, just doing, doing and doing our jobs, et cetera. We forget to pause and say, what do I need to be learning what do I, you know, how do I keep an eye out on what's happening in the market moving forward, right? So, you know, just just being a little bit more future focused. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and this leads me to my next question pretty well. Something I ask all my guests is what is a polymath to you? Uh, I would say a polymath is somebody who is curious and who has a an expansive mindset and wants to, yeah, fulfill their curiosities, I would say. Because I think that, and I'm, actually, I don't think I, I, from hundreds of people that I've spoken with on, on this topic, when it comes to career change, most of us want to do something more than what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> That's the reality. It's just we're limited sometimes because of responsibilities and certain things that limit us from pursuing other areas of interest. And, and the thing is that we don't have, you know, being curious and being this polymath does not mean you need to quit your job and like, and do all these different things. It just means like being curious enough to be like, what is it that I want to experiment with and explore? And how can I do that outside of my, you know, regular nine to five or, you know, the, the main job? Because yes, people have responsibilities and not everybody has the freedom or the privilege to be able to be like, I'm just going to go try this job. And, and not everybody has the same access. And that's the reality of life. But a majority of people do have it. Yeah. They're just they're just either they they know something is often they're like oh, I really want to make a change, but they don't know how to do it, or they know how to make a change but they're afraid. They're mm -hmm. afraid because they're in a comfort zone, and which is like my whole thing is like helping people get out of their comfort zone, <laughs> right? Like because once you take that step, you're like oh wow, like that's a, you realize there's nothing to be like afraid of on the other side. And I always ask a question like just picture worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. picture your worst case scenario if you were to make the shift right and the chances are the worst case scenario is not very bad and it's all in our mind and that helps you kind of get over the fear of you know trying different things so a polymath i would say is somebody who is who's just you know curious and with an expansive uh mindset it's always interesting every time i ask that question i always expect like a simple answer or something like that and it's always a beautiful answer like that and it's it's always surprising and it just makes me think too, there's this idea behind generalist in human history. And I really wanted to share this because I, I thought it was fascinating. There was this researcher at the Max Planck Institute of Technology who did a study about why Homo sapiens evolved, but not Neanderthals and Homo erectus. And basically it was because of the fact that like Homo sapiens who had to move all around the world, it was the generalist in us who were able to adapt to new environments and be able to try new foods without dying, obviously, and being able to adapt to these new places and actually evolve from there. There's a reason why our species survived, whereas other ones probably didn't. And I thought that was a fascinating study because it's one of those things where it proves that even from the beginning of our lifespan of, as a species, we were generalists and we've been yeah. ever since. Yeah, and I love it. It's it's almost like you need to be able to adapt in order to survive. And if you think about it, and actually, this is really beautiful that you said that, because if you think about it, what has happened with this, you know, after 2020, is that a lot of people that were those generalists, they were able to take those skills elsewhere. So if you're in hospitality, and your industry went down the drain, or, you know, you know, I don't know, retail or something like that. Like if you were able to shift to something else and do it successfully, probably because you, you've you developed another set of skills or where you were able to present yourself in a certain way, that's great. But there's a lot of people who are like, wow, this is all I know how to do. Mm -hmm. What do I do next? So it's almost like a survival thing. And I really, really believe that. Like, you know, you need to, you know, fine, be in, be, have your niche somewhere. It's good to have a niche, but then look at other areas that you can potentially kind of explore as well because i really really feel like that's the future yeah. um i mean again i and i i think it's going to be both it just depends on what works for you like right there's no magic form there's no magic answers here like at the end of the day just you you know what is it that you want to do and what is what does the future look like and it could be that you you might you might be finding yourself in that little niche maybe maybe not but it could be that you need to be that generalist yeah. Um, but I think like being, having other skill set and expanding on your skill set will always add value versus being very narrow. Yeah. Well, and I would honestly be the first to say too, that I think we need specialists. We need both. And mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of generals out there who's like, oh, we only need generalists. Everyone needs to be generalists. And it's like, no, we need both. We need to have a balance and going beyond that. 
it's opportunist mindset as well. A lot of people last year saw it as an opportunity to do something new. I, I, some of my guests even said a COVID resolution kind of thing where I shouldn't probably say the word because I know that some podcast platforms are getting mad about uh, that word and like, yeah, but in a 2020 resolution, I guess you could say, <laughs> and having something new that's happening during that time span. And I always wanted to do interviews, didn't know how I was going to do it. And all of a sudden, matchmaker.fm platform came on my lap and I was able to start doing interviews just right then and there. And so I had 42 episodes that were solo beforehand I cut that off. Okay, that's my first season right there. Started the second season. Let's do interviews. And now mm-hmm. you're my 86th guest since May oh, of last year. Yeah. And it's one of those things where I managed to make a new endeavor that way. I'm, I want to ask you too, did you have a 2020 resolution, so to speak, last year? Oh, gosh. I didn't think about that one. Um, An opportunity that you took advantage of, so to speak. Yeah. Well, I mean, for us, it really, it kind of accelerated our business again because we we've been mm-hmm. we've been kind of pushing for this you know, remote learning, but in an engaging way for quite some time. And, you know, we kept, you know, we kept, you know, advising companies that we work with to say, listen, like this one to two day training, you know, six, six hours a day in a classroom, it just doesn't work. Wonderful. You know, you, you people get together, they enjoy, maybe they like the instructor, you know, the instructor was fun and, or, or they were popular among the group, etc. but they walk away with no knowledge. So mm-hmm. you've just wasted time and money. But of course, we all know that companies don't do it just for the sake of learning. It's more of just ticking the boxes in many cases. And another one is people, it's an opportunity for people to get out of the office and just to do something outside. And usually in places like Dubai, training takes place in very nice hotels with nice conferences, nice kind of lunches, et cetera. So it's it's almost like a little getaway for a couple of days for many employees. But so but learning does not take very rarely does learning take place, especially when it comes to soft skills, develop leadership development, these sort of things. Very rarely. So, so we've been pushing towards that. And, and once we all kind of went online last year, it, you know, they still wanted companies still wanted to continue talent development. It decreased significantly, of course, mm-hmm. um, you know, due to budgets, but they were still able to say, okay, yeah, let's, let's, let's organize some trainings around, around these topics, et cetera. And what they found is that it is, it actually is more affordable for them. So it, it costs one third versus regular training because they don't have to pay for the you know accommodation of a trainer, transportation, all of that, renting spaces to host these things, etc. So and learning does take place. So retention is actually much higher uh, using certain methodologies, like in our case mm-hmm. with the mi- micro learnings and behavior change that it actually sticks and it works and so for us that was kind of the the pivoting on a, on a professional side yeah on, on a personal side there's there's been a few as well it's more of just our understanding of how resilient we really are you know and how adaptive to change and i mean like i remember my business partner i we were just like well we're just gonna take this one week at a time and that's all mm-hmm. right you know you know because that i mean that's a mindset so it definitely pushed on a personal side like our mindset to to the max mm-hmm. um you know because it's um you you really have to see it as an opportunity you know and i think because it, it wasn't easy it wasn't easy for many people so i think it's just i, I love the point about just seeing the opportunity that's that's what it's all about it's perspective it's mindset and you can see it as oh the world is ending and it's all doom and gloom or you can say like what do i do with it how do i milk this how do i make the best of this yeah amazing answer and it is that adaptive learning as well that you're kind of mentioning there the new micro learning as well and that's one of the things with the much degree i was trying to go for is try to approach it in a more neuroscience-based way where there's a there's a lot of ideas behind switching between tasks and how doing too many switching is actually bad for learning. It's actually bad for doing what you're actually getting something done. But as a lifeguard, actually, I found out that we actually switch parts of the focus whenever we switch areas or switch tasks. In order to keep our focus, we only have a certain amount of focus bandwidth that we can have, usually about 30 minutes or so. And so we had three zones in the pool and we would switch zones every 30 minutes to maximize the focus of of our uh, mental capacity. And I thought that's an interesting way of going about it. And there's also the Pomodoro technique where you can only focus for so much time and take a break, do it again. And incorporating things like that, the interleaving mindset, as well as having the choice. So I came up with this idea of skill tree based learning. So I'm always a much of a avid gamer and in video games. We have these skill trees and throughout the game, you apply points to these different parts of the skill tree. You gain new skills, you apply those skills. Oftentimes they actually give you more actions to do in the game. So you actually learn 
in the game, like what you're doing, like what if we took a course that way? Instead of having a linear MOOC where you have module after module after module, you have multiple pathways and modules and you can switch between them into like as interleaving a freedom of choice. You choose, if you're getting bored down this pathway, you switch to another one that's related. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that actually. And I love the what you said about lifeguarding. I didn't think about it from that perspective, but you're totally right. They they do definitely switch uh, from place to place. It's like 30 minutes or something, right? Like mm-hmm. every 30 minutes or something. Yeah, that's really, that's a good point. Um, yeah, listen, I, I mean, this this is what I'm really curious about. I don't know. I, I mean, there's not a lot of stuff that's out there about, about like, I mean, like implement, implemented and, and some of the things that you're talking about, but I, I do see how, this can be very interesting. Speaking just from personal experience, I used to, the reason I changed so many jobs is because I would just get bored. Yeah, um, same. <laughs> <laughs> I would just get bored. I'm like, I don't like, sure. Like some, some things take time, but, and like there's a difference between being in a job and, and just being, you know, learning about it and be, just being better because you feel it's the right fit and you are continuously curious. And that's why you, you know, you want to stay and you want to grow and you want to learn, et cetera, about that particular area of your work. But then there's jobs where you're just completely bored and you're like, this is definitely not for me. Right. Um, mm-hmm. So, so I can, I definitely like that, the, the model that you're talking about would certainly be suited to somebody like myself. And, and to be honest, it probably made me feel a little bit better back then about myself because I used to be like, what is wrong with me? Mm-hmm. Why am I so bored? How is it that people find these jobs and they just, you know, they graduate stick to it. and they stick to it and they're like, they're, you know, and everything's so simple and smooth. And here I am just starting from scratch every job I get. And it's like, I mean, the jobs that I've done are the most random things on earth, you know? So, so it's like, so, so I think that model would work very well. And I think we need to also be open to the idea that maybe that's the way for many people to go because yeah. it doesn't, it, again, there's no right or wrong when it comes to career or your future, it's just about figuring out what works for you. And, and I wish there was less, I wish there was less negativity around that. I wish, you know, the market would adapt to people into the polymaths, right? Yeah. To, to, to people that bring so much to the table. But this is also why we have a lot of gig economy that came out, right? And that's growing in the freelancing world for for people like us who are like, I don't want to just come in and do the routine nine to five, 365 days a year, same thing, same kind of cycles at a job. So, but for some people, they like it. So that's another Mm -hmm. thing, right? So some people want to. So again, I think it's just personal choice, like personalized education, whatever works for you, future focused, self-awareness, that's it. Yeah, well, let me share a secret motivation as to why I created a modular degree. I wanted to create an education for polymaths because it's one of those things where we don't have a system for it. And you were talking about how you felt when you were younger and how like you felt like, why am I so unfocused? Why am I not able to do what other people can do? And it's because we live in a special society. There's that stigma, that conformity that we, you and I have to naturally fight against when we shouldn't. Like I said, it's a natural inclination to be generalist. We need both and we've had both throughout our history. And yet, for some reason, in our social construct, we've only focused on the specialized niche. And I thought it was interesting, too, because uh, you mentioned earlier how many uh, jobs you've worked over the years. And I, I mentioned how I did six jobs at once, basically. And that was with my first employer. It was through one employer. And my first job ever was a lifeguard. And then I became a swim instructor, then a water box instructor, and a pool manager, <laughs> and a fitness attendant, and a personal trainer. Those are all in the same place. And actually, as it turns out, we were both lifeguards. So can you tell me use your time as one? Yeah, yeah. So that was like, uh, right when I think started university, like, yeah, right after, right after graduating high school, I think like, or at my last year in high school, I was also lifeguarding. So that was a really cool experience. So for me, I come from a background of swimming. So my, mm-hmm. my, my mom actually is a master of sport and swimming. My brother used to be uh, compete professionally swimming. So and in Russia, growing up in Russia, swimming is one of our like top sports that, mm-hmm. that kids kind of go to. You know, it's like that. It's, uh, you know, figure skating and a bunch of a few other things. But that was like our sport. So so I was always into swimming. It kind of came naturally to me. And, you know, I needed a job. So I was like, well, I love the water. I love the pool. I'm a good swimmer. Like, let's let's do this, you know. Um, and then in the summertime, you get a nice tan if you're doing outdoor, <laughs> yes. you know, you're sitting in an outdoor pool. So, and it's a fun, fun group of people that you typically tend to meet. So I've been some really great people. We had some really good times, um, uh, you know, with, with the, and, and I, I used to also be an instructor. So I used to teach little kids how to swim. Um, awesome. I never made it to the pool manager though, but no. uh, I, got, I got bored and then I went somewhere else. <laughs> well, but, 
uh, but that's yeah, awesome. Really cool experience. Listen, yeah, and yeah, it's I mean, it's a uh, yeah, cool, cool experiences, and I cannot tell you how much of these kind of jobs that really formulated my skill set today when it comes to people. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really those jobs and it's and it's those hard jobs like and some of them you know they're not the most exciting jobs sometimes right but they and you're looking back you're like wow that was a really great experience um but yeah that, that didn't make me all excited yeah no that's awesome and one thing i just remembered is that like how i became a water bus instructor or pool manager was interesting i think people listening in could benefit from it i literally just asked like i, I yeah. straight up went to the office where my boss and mini boss was uh, like the the second person, the second command. <laughs> I like saying mini boss because, like I said, gamer. But uh, <laughs> I go in there and I'm like, hey, I want to become a pool manager and water burst instructor. And we have a little conversation about it. Like, okay, why do you, why would you think you're a good fit for it? And I like I explain my mentality. And I probably wasn't like really good at selling myself, but the fact that I took that like chance of doing it was important. And then literally, not two days later, one of the instructors didn't show up, and I was lifeguarding. So my boss, I call my boss because it's just me and the manager at that point because you know, it's early in the morning. And uh, she's like, well, you can teach it. And I'm like, oh, oh, and all the butterflies and nervousness kick in. I'm like, I don't know. And then I just did it. And then from then yeah. on, I taught. And I've, I, I actually don't lifeguard anymore, but I still teach water aerobics because yeah. it's one of those things that still stuck around. And it was just like, you had to take that opportunity, take that chance. Listen, I love that. And I have to pick up on that. That is one of the biggest things that I see in corporate. So we expect, it, it all comes down to expectations. We expect that if we do the job and we do it well, somebody's going to come and say, you know what, Dustin, it's time. We want you to do this. That's not always going to happen. The chances are that, and in the corporations, it's a, I mean, it's a cutthroat environment in mm. some of them. So if you don't speak up, if you don't position yourself in the, around the right kind of networks internally and externally, it's going to, you can be the best person and you can be doing be- the better job than the guy or the girl that gets promoted. But they were the ones who had the courage to go and ask. They were the ones who put themselves out there. And unfortunately, that's the game we have to play. So for in corporations, that's very much the case. But in fact, it's everywhere. If you don't ask, right, you're never going to know the answer. And you need, and this is where that responsibility of the individual comes in, right? Sure, sure, we can expect universities to prepare us. We can expect, you know, we can have expectations of the corporate role of our managers. But at the end of the day, what we can control is what is it that I'm doing? Mm-hmm. How am I positioning myself for my future? Because at the end of the day, you care more about you than anybody else. That's the reality. Yeah. Nobody will care about you the way you do. <laughs> even family members like, at that point too. Sometimes even family members. Like, yeah. And that's all right. But that also gives you a lot of power because you're like, yeah. wow, like there's a lot I can do with that. So what, what do I want to do next? And how can I get there? And, you know, who do I need to talk to? And what's the worst that will happen? Like somebody will say no. Mm-hmm. And, and or like in a corporate, like if you're, if you, if you get a door closed from the beginning, for example, right. If you go to your management and you express the, the want to kind of, you know, grow, et cetera. And they, and they, they make it clear that that's not going to happen. Then that's a good time that you, you know, that's, that's good that you didn't waste time being there just mm-hmm. to hit a dead end anyway. So you might as well find out about this sooner than later. Yeah. Right. So it's like, well, and I think a lot of people are just scared of change. And like, if a, co- if a company is not willing to hire, like promote you and you do a ton of good work. My uncle was, is an amazingly hard worker and he, he worked for a uh, internet company in town and he basically was the lead uh, IT guy there. And as for an internet company, and IT is a very important position, but they treated him like crap. He was one of the main people who were doing the actual repairing all the computers in there, making sure everything was running. He'd be there like basically 24-7 if he had to be. And yet they didn't promote him. They didn't treat him well. And so he left for a competitor in town and like basically got a way better job, way better uh, income from it. And this is one of those things where he had to be brave enough to leave, even though by leaving, he's going to screw them over because they, they're not going to find one person to replace him. They're going to find three people to replace him. He was worth yeah. three people to them. And yet they yeah. weren't keeping them around. And it's one of those things where as an employee, you have to think about, well, I need to take care of myself, take care of my family even. And so I have to make sure I take that opportunity, that leap, like you did when you went to Dubai, when you had didn't have a job, didn't have a pl- really pathway in front of you just yet. You had to take that leap and it was a much better experience for you in your life overall. Yeah. And you know, so the, on my podcast, which I, I need to have you on, by the way, and we need to switch these roles, yeah, that but, sounds good. you know, on, on my podcast, we talk about like, you know, helping people get out of the comfort zone. And I can tell you so far the the trend that I've seen when, you know, we talk about change and how people like, kind of overcame different changes in their lives. And the one thing that people always say is that then you just need to believe in yourself. Like you need to believe 
so much in yourself that no matter what decision you make, you're gonna, it's going to be fine. And I think that's, again, and that goes back to self-awareness, right? So I really feel like self-awareness is the base of it all. Um, you know, and yeah, just believe this is the theme that I'm starting to see emerge from the conversations that I'm having. And I really should probably do something with that. But it's, it's the belief that whatever's next, it's going to work out. Even though, even if the world is falling up around you, the belief in yourself is, um, and it's, it also very much relates to that growth mindset, which is all about, you know, believing and in, in yourself, believing that you can improve and that things can get better and that you can get better. Yeah. Um, right. It's, it's, it's all about that. So it just comes down to, to believe in yourself as simple as it sounds, but it really is sometimes that simple. Yeah. Well, and speaking of your podcast too, correct me if I'm wrong. It seems like you started it late last year, Shift Podcast. And so what brought upon that new endeavor? Yeah. So um, honestly, just curiosity and wanting to have these kind of conversations with people, yeah. um, you it's know, and, and after, after being, you know, I was a trainer for a couple of years, um, like full on trainer, um, uh, training people in organizations and kind of going into corporations and, you know, you know, doing trainings from mid-level to senior level managers. And what I can tell you is that one of the biggest challenges people have is this, you know, fear of change and getting out of their, people get very comfortable. And when you're very comfortable, it becomes, when you get very comfortable and you're happy there, beautiful, stay there, no need to do anything, right? But if you're very comfortable, but you want to change, but you're so comfortable that change is so scary. This is where I see a lot of, you know, individuals just don't make their steps. And then years later, they, they still maybe do it, but then it's like yeah, they've waited five, 10, 20 years sometimes to make the change. So I wanted to just have people on the podcast and have conversations around, you know, how did they overcome change that happens? Like what helped them, right? Mm-hmm. To, to, to show people that at the end of the day, everybody deals with the same, like everybody has challenges and it's, and, and, and there are simple things that you can do to help you overcome the fear of change overcome the getting out of the, your comfort zone and and that there is something better on the other side yeah. um, you know so so that just yeah just and i love content um as you do i mean you you know you're great at creating the content and i mean you I'm, too I'm, i've I'm seen your amateur. channels i'm an amateur compared to you dustin you are so on point um with uh, with your content i mean you're really i admire you for that but i just love to create content and have conversations and uh, i wish i could just record all my conversations yeah. so that's exactly what i started doing i was like i just want to and then let's throw in some questions around there and just see where it goes just just being curious that's it well and i, I keep getting a lot of gary v philosophy from you in this conversation where like document your <laughs> conversation so to speak but on top of that too like he talks about if you're not happy with your situation, then change it and yeah. go. And like, if you have a few hours a day where you're sitting there watching Netflix, take, screw that, learn something new, start a personal brand and like put that off to the side. Like you can put your interests of Netflix is still going to be there 10 years from now when you want to watch that show or five yeah. years from now or whatnot, go work on what you want to do. And also what has come of your podcast? What about it? It really, truly excites you. You kind of touched on that already, but I thought I'd ask again. Just, I guess when I, when I talk to people, I just, it, keeps bringing back to the idea that we're so much more alike than we're different Mm -hmm. as humans. Like we're just so much more alike and we all just essentially like strive for the same things Mm -hmm. and we're all just trying to figure it out and nobody really knows what they're doing half the time and everybody's just kind of experimenting. And, and, and that's the beautiful part about it and that you don't need to be perfect. And and having kind of worked with individuals that are quite senior, very accomplished, right? Big titles, you know, big companies, et cetera. And I can tell you that, you know, that CEO is just as vulnerable, (laughs) you know, it's just as, as has the same challenges that everybody else. um, And just, you know, and they have the same kind of things that they deal with in in an organization as, you know, being an employee of that organization. I think just if we, if we were to remove all those titles that very much, um, sure, people should be respected for that. They've gotten to a certain levels, but at the end of the day, like removing some of those the, the ideas that we have around people who have certain titles um, and, you know, people feel intimidated because this person has done this and that, like, yeah, but you realize that their story is very simple and mm-hmm. you could also do that, <laughs> right. you know, like, so we're much more alike than we're different. It's, uh, yeah. Well, it's we forget we're all human. Quite, yeah, we're all humans. I think we forget that. We really, really mm-hmm. do. We forget that. Um, I wanted to mention a point, but it slipped my mind now. You mentioned something about Gary Vee and I wanted to make a point of, oh yeah. So a, a big part of a big blocker for many people is also their environment. And I really, really, I mean, for me it was as well. And I, I really believe that 
your environment matters. So one of the first audits that anybody should do is like, A, how do you spend your time, Mm -hmm. right? What do you spend your time with and who do you spend your time? And what are those people doing? Are they where, uh, do they inspire you essentially? Like, you know, do they inspire you? And and another question I get is like, okay, Elena, wonderful. We wanna have all these great networks, these high profile networks. Like how do you enter those high profile networks? And the question, the, the, the answer to that is, you become the person of value. And sometimes mm-hmm. to become that person of value to re because somebody who's at, at a level that's kind of maybe a step above on whatever scale, right? You need to almost live up to that level in order for you to have access to those networks, right? So that means that you need to become, you need to become the person that yeah. you aspire to. Like you need to become the person that can add value and be in that network. Because sure, if you're, if you're, I don't know, if you're like a negative person, let's say, for example, if you're a person who, you know, Netflix and chill every day, you know, after work and brunch every weekend, like at the end of the day, like you're going to have a very hard time entering networks of people who are like go-getters. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're maybe entrepreneurs. Maybe they're just really passionate about their careers and they're just kind of creating and producing things continuously, et cetera. There's just, there's a mismatch of interests. So you have to get real with yourself and say like, okay, I want to be in this area of these profile networks, right? These high profile networks how can I add value? And that's what networking is about, right? It's about how do I add value to where those people see value in me, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not because somebody's better or worse. It's just everybody has time and everybody is very cautious with their time and how they spend their time and who they spend their time with. And so we have to become a person of value to to that level of those networks. And sometimes that means spending some time alone, working on yourself, growing yourself, and then eventually being able to then have those kind of individuals in your life. Yeah, exactly. And before Poly Innovator, actually, this is something I, I always think about is that I created the United Living Construct, which was meant to be a hub of innovation. It was what got me started into blogging and content creation in the first place. And I realized that as I was building it out, I could keep working on it for the next 15 years and try to get it out that way. But I realized that there needed to be a leader who was good enough to actually get it running and getting that organization going. And I, I wanted to be that leader, but I realized I wasn't good enough for it. And it wasn't a self-deprecating thing. It wasn't mm-hmm. anything negative. It was a realization that I needed to grow. I needed to learn. And that's what started the do-it-yourself modular degree that I focused on. In fact, I collected over 450 courses in order to try to get it started. Like I wanted to learn, learn, learn as much as I could. And over time, I cut the fat and I trimmed that down to less than hundred courses or so. But it's interesting how that's what got started on that self-education endeavor because I needed to become better. I needed to become more than who I was already. And it's interesting too, because that choice of learning more and actually having that self-curation, it's it's one of the first things that I focused on. And it, it made me think too, you changed your major five times in university. And I think that's something that's the same kind of mentality there where we wanted to improve. We wanted to keep changing. We wanted to keep finding what was truly what we're good at. And, our, into the, uh, and that indecisiveness, I feel that it's not a bad thing. Uh, in fact, in the book David by David Epstein Range, he talks about dabbling and how trying out many different things to find out what you truly enjoy doing and good at is actually what's really important. That's actually what helps you get to that specialty and expert level knowledge. So how do you think we can improve that curiosity driven process i know a loaded question there long question yeah. but how do you think we can improve it <laughs> so it's a big one um well if i just go back to my experience of changing majors i just the the thing is that i go back to like we don't know what we don't know and the beautiful part about it is that now we have access to information right so and and this is what we often don't even do like like i i do this i ask this question sometimes in sessions that i do with students and i'm like how many of you have looked at future of work reports Mm. and it's like crickets like nobody i'm like well what do you mean like this should be your focus like you need to look at what's what the future of work looks like for you right so and as simple as that it's just going doing research about what are the hot and trendy jobs of the future what skills do i need to have right yeah but again going back to kind of why i changed means i didn't know i just didn't know i didn't have access to that so and this is where, you know, podcasts, listening to people's stories are very helpful, like reading, audio, whatever works for you. Because I, I learned the hard way. And the reason I changed my major five times is because I kept 
going well one it was lack of self-awareness and i kind of was just going to like i i remember i think one of the first majors i chose was graphic design and i'm like the worst person when it comes to detail i'm not detail oriented i don't care much about computers you know it's, but that was a hot trendy thing but it wasn't me my brain just doesn't function that way right um and then i went into accounting failed it twice couldn't get into it but i wanted to go into like finance and accounting because everybody said oh that's where the money is at so yeah. that's what you should be doing and, and then I tried different things and I finally ended up with um, international relations because I was like, oh, cool. It's international. Like, I like it. I get to meet different people because that was the whole point of that was my whole my whole thing is when when I remember when my career advisor asked me what I want to do for 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 my career. I was like, well, I don't know. I don't even know what I'm having for lunch or dinner today, but <laughs> let's talk about my life. Right. So um, and, and I think that. So lack of self-awareness, but then I knew my interest though. I kind of had the, the, the I, I knew I wanted to work with people. I knew I didn't want to be behind a desk. I knew I wanted to do some travel, etc. I had that, but there was nobody to, to feed into that curiosity. And I didn't have the skills to be able to do it myself. And I think that's where this is exactly why we started Bloom Youth is because we want to give students those conversations, those opportunities to think beyond what is in front of them beyond what the society says this is the major that you should pursue because at the end of the day for universities it's a business university yeah. education is a business they're going to sell you whatever programs they're offering but maybe that might not be the best choice for you right and all that uh, another thing is they don't know they don't know what's best for you i had my academic advisor at that point who's you know brilliant but told me that i probably shouldn't pursue a a, a second language because english wasn't my first language um, I ended up pursuing anyway Arabic, and I, I aced it. I took like I took a, a few, uh, a few um, I think it was like two semesters of Arabic, and I did very well in it. Um, and I can still read and learn, uh, write to this day from that course. And no, English is not my first language, but it it worked out. So, and again, like people want what's the best for you, but you need to know what's best. You need to know your capabilities. Mm -hmm. No, no, you know and. To be able to experiment and test those. Now I just went on a rampage. That I, don't even, I, think I love it. No, it's good. Your, from your question. <laughs> no, it's good. But, the show is all about getting into the meta. It's good. <laughs> yeah. So, but, but yeah, so I think what we can do is A, that trust your instinct when, you know, go back to the basics. Like, what do you want to do? Because mm -hmm. I knew, and I think we all know what we want to do, but then we can't find a box that we fit into, like the polymath, right? Like how mm -hmm. we kind of felt. We can't find a box that we could fit into. So we go to where it makes sense. And because what else are you going to do? So I think, A, creating your own box, which is exactly like the modular model that you were talking about, right? So creating creating your own box, essentially, and then not being afraid to change and just not be afraid to change and experiment. There's nothing wrong with wanting to try different things. Eventually, you will find that thing that you really want to do, or maybe a few different things. Yeah. No, wonderful. Love it. Well, and it's interesting too, because like you said, having that choice and we put so much pressure on these young kids to make a permanent life decision, but it's not that permanent. Like even if you chose to get a degree, you get that life decision, you do that career for a couple of years, that's fine to change. It's okay to change. It's your life. Have that choice. Have that power of choice. Yeah, no, it's so good you bring it up because when I talk to students, when I work with students and they are so nervous about making the wrong choice of their career. And I'm like, listen, like you're <laughs> just choose anything, just do anything right now. Like, what do you want? What do you feel like doing? Like you have your majority of young students that are graduating, right? They, they have all the possibilities in the world. Like you, you don't have responsibilities that much yet. Right. Like, I mean, sure, maybe to some extent, but you will never have the kind of freedom you have to just experiment because you have a lot of time to recover. Like you'll find ways to recover financial and server. You know, you can change, you can change continuously. Try different things. You don't like it, quit. Like mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with that. That's exactly what I did. Like, you know, I was like, this is not going to work well. Like I got to go, you know, I'm not wasting my time here. Let me go make money somewhere else. And, um, and again, because you don't have, you know, I think, I think as first students really need to move away from this. Like, oh, I need to have a salary you're going to have plenty of time to make money. Money is going to come like just do experiment because never, I mean, the older you get, the more responsibilities you get, the more kind of niche you get into particular areas, perhaps for majority of us. Right. So, you know, and, and the less opportunities you have to experiment to try things. So yeah. take advantage, like take advantage. There's nothing wrong with that. And, and again, I think it just comes down to, we care a lot about, you know, what perception and whatnot perception. Yeah. yeah. I think that's what it is. Yeah. Well, it's speaking of perception, I, I was always, I taught 
water aerobics. And so a lot of my clientele are geriatric and more the older crowd. And they always called me a baby. They always called me a young, young little lad. And I always hate, especially as a teenager, being called young and almost like treated as if I was immature, even if I was doing things that were mature actions, like be able to teach people in a respectful way and like t- take care of them. And I realized that people like just like treated me as if I was a baby. And as I got older, it gave me perspective. Like you and I both are babies. Like we have a long lifespan ahead of us, yeah. and we are we both have just like barely even scratch the surface. And it's just interesting how like there's so much more we can do, so many more different things we can try. And it's just an amazing little thought that way. Yeah, I think I think it's just yeah we just need to stop as a society pushing on ourselves like oh we need to have it all figured out or just just enjoy do try experiment that's it like now with with the global you know markets like you can you can monetize in so many different ways it's just mm-hmm. it's just you got to get that experience that's it got to get that experience that exposure that personal branding those networks that's where it's it's it sounds simple it's not it maybe it sounds very simple and and I guess in theory it might be but it, it could essentially be that simple like it doesn't yeah. have to be very hard. It's just, I mean, and like for you, like you've been, you've been blogging, I mean, for since, since 2011, I mean, you started blogging. So, and that's the thing, like, like in, in your case, because you're genuinely curious, like you genuinely care about these things and you just, mm-hmm. and it's, it's probably fun for you. You know, it's, it's exciting for you. Even you when know? I get the challenges, it's fun. Yeah. Like it's just, it's just, it's fun. And, and, and you, you, you stuck to it. And so to, to reach to where you are today. Right. So, so, I think that's where it's at. Just do something you enjoy because you're always going to just be good at. You're, you're going to want to be better and better each day uh, at that guy. thing, you know? Yeah, yeah, you're Ikigai, exactly. Yeah. Well, and I know we have to wrap up here soon, but there's a couple of things I wanted to touch on, like your personal brand. But before that, why is the pink suit your lucky suit? Oh, I love my, I used to get jokes so much because like, uh, my friends like, Elena, really, again, you know that I actually went and made that exact same suit in like five different colors? I loved it. Um, I don't know. I just, I just, I just love that suit. It is perfect for presentations. You feel comfortable. It's, it's not restraining. You don't sweat in it. Uh, You, you, you just, it's, it's light. It's, it's, yeah. You look good in it. It's like, it's good. You look, you look good in it. You look presentable in it. The color pops. I love the color of it. I just loved it. It was my first like proper pantsuit. Um, and I just loved it. Like, I just loved it. So yeah, taking know, notes, just... what you're saying is I need to get a pink suit. <laughs> just whatever outfit works for you, right? But I mean, yeah. like, I just loved it. I just, I, I don't know. I just really loved that suit. It, I felt confident in it. I don't, maybe mm-hmm. it's just a mindset thing because I felt like I looked good in it. I, it made me feel confident. And I just always called it my lucky suit. So anytime I have something important, I would wear it. But then I realized I can't just keep wearing the same suit. So I made them in different colors. <laughs> You can't keep just wearing the same suit. Like people can, be, you just say like you have multiple copies of the same suit and be like, hey, yeah. it's, a, it's a different suit. It's just yeah. I did make it in a slightly <laughs> different other shade of pink. <laughs> I did, just a bit, but it's the same suit basically. I, <laughs> so. I love fun questions like that because it's one of those things too where if it makes you feel confident, that's what matters. And like when you first start presenting too, it's nerve wracking. It reminds me, I started doing karaoke uh, pretty young actually, but I, I wanted to learn how to sing. So I was going there religiously. But when I first started, man, as much as I love singing and as much as I love the attention too, no less, I was so nervous. My leg was shaking the first time I ever sang. <laughs> yeah. And I was just like, dang, okay. But once you get used to it, it's a lot better. But having that clothes that make you feel more confident is always helpful. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So going back on your personal brand too, you contributed to Forbes and Entrepreneur magazines and particularly in the Middle East there too. How did you get your personal brand built enough to get into those publications? Um, so I used to produce a lot of content, like just like you, um, just, I just used to write articles, um, on my LinkedIn, on my personal blog. I would just, I just felt like I wanted to share knowledge. And I think that's where it's at. I think it's just, if you genuinely put, put out knowledge out there, it just kind of gravitates to you. I mean, in, in my case, I, I had, I had some doors open through my networks, mm-hmm. um, for, for some of these, but having, having had a portfolio that I could share with, Forbes and entrepreneur and whatever else, 
that's what that's that's what got me in the door essentially right like so if you know you can get the networks but then you also again it goes back to that experience what are you going to show these people like how, why should they publish your stuff and you're like oh well actually i've been writing for x y and z and here's an article for you and you can see my work here here and here and so you create this portfolio so i would just like literally i would save all the articles and different topics that i've written and uh, across different platforms so then it kind of it, it gives you credibility as well yes. like okay this person has been writing and i've been i was doing it for years I wasn't, I, I don't monetize on these things. Like, you know, you, you don't make money from writing these things, but it was just pure curiosity. Like, oh, I learned something new. Let me talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, let me publish it. Let me share the knowledge because I love to read. I love to listen to people. Um, I learn a lot. Um, and I think every single person has something unique to, to offer. Um, perspective is interesting to have different perspective on things. So so I just, yeah, just, I just started writing. And then I, and when I was ready to pitch to these different publications, I was, I had a portfolio ready, ready to go, but, and I didn't yeah. plan on it, by the way, like that wasn't my aim when I started writing. It wasn't like, oh, let me, you know, let me, let me do this so that one day I'm going to have this portfolio. No, I just wanted to put my thoughts on paper. Mm -hmm. You had to get it out somehow too. Speak, uh, yeah, I, I, the perfect example is one of my recent posts that I made is literally one of the best posts I ever written. I, I don't know how it happened, but literally I was in that alpha wave state right before going to bed. I was about to go to sleep. Like I was just close to going to sleep and I had this idea of going on the channel as a content creator. It's something that I've been talking about. It's one of my ethos when it comes to content creation. And I just had this idea for a blog post. And I got up, like I, I couldn't resist it. I got up, I wrote out the outline and went right back to bed. Like it, and my outline is a certain length usually that I write. This was three times that length, wow. just the outline of itself. And the next day I got up, wrote 4,000 words. The next wow. day after that, wrote 3,000 words. So this is a 7,000 word blog post. And it's one of those things where I, I do want to make money off of blogging at some point. I want to have a paid subscription, but I also want to provide value. And I also mm -hmm. wanted to provide as much information as possible. And as a content creator, this is one of the best posts I ever made as a personal brand or content creator, like information dense posts. And it's like, I don't need to monetize this. I want to get this out for free so people can actually see it. And also people see what kind of posts I'll make for the paid subscription too. But more, more importantly, just kind of put that out there. I'll send it to you later too. But it's, it was one of yeah, those things where it's it was just interesting how it just came to be. It just kind of got that idea out of my mind. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I read your slide deck on personal brands. And it's interesting too. How do you think we should build our personal brands in a modern sense? I think start, starting to just kind of identifying looking at those like previous experiences and achievements i think we already have a brand everybody has a brand mm -hmm. it's just a matter of do you know what it is um and if you don't know what it is you can actually ask your network so there's a, a cool survey you can do you can do like an anonymous survey to your network just use surveymonkey.com mm -hmm. ask them a few questions like you know, uh, anonymous, right? So ask them a few questions, like open-end questions, like, you know, if, you, if they were to come to you for advice, what it would be for, or if you were to win an award, like if you really don't know where to start with your personal brand, that's a good one. Because if 30 out of 40 people that you send it to say, I would come to you to advice in this area. And then this area, you're like, yeah, okay, that's great because that's where I'm working. Or maybe maybe this area, you never even explored. And you're like, oh, wow, I didn't realize I'm portraying that. So the idea is to look at how you want to be perceived and how mm -hmm. is the network perceiving you at the moment and making sure that there's no gap. And if there is a gap between how you actually perceive yourself and how, how you want to, you know, the network to perce perceive you, if there's a gap, then you need to do something about that gap. Um, and this, and then that's where the work comes in is to say, okay, what do I want to be known for? What do I want to put out, out there? And what do I want to stand for? And what do I want my network to know about me? Because that's, that's, that's where it comes down to, you know, tomorrow, if somebody needs to, I don't know, hire somebody who creates content, right? Like for me, I'm going to think of Dustin, like, you know, or if it's going to be like in polymath or some kind of, you know, the modular approach to education, I'm going to be like Dustin, because I know this is, this yeah. is your thing, right? So you, it's a very clear, it's clear across a lot of the things that you're doing on your website, for example. So it's quite clear what you're doing. So I think it's it's understanding what message you want to send, and then and then creating a creating you know your marketing, your social media, your you know materials that is out there, uh, doing podcasts, etc. Talking about topics that you really feel passionate about, and then creating content around that, um, so that and people need to see it, right? Like so that's that's where it comes in. People need to see your content, and it can be in different forms. And also know where your audience is, like where is your audience hang out, and who mm -hmm. needs to know. What is it that you know? That's a very strong point there. And something you hit me, like something you said hit me close in the heart there is that you said that I convey what my topic is very well. And like, I, I 
I've struggled with that. And I think it's interesting how polymath is almost an anti-niche in a way, where it's not just one thing. And because of it, I can't just talk about one thing. I can't just niche down to one topic. And I was really impressed with how on the channel you are like i <laughs> for those who are listening in you can look at the description there's going to be a long list of links and it's probably the longest i've had out of all my guests too because all the featured in all the different posts you had all different things you were one of the only people that i've met that had a quora blog post like me like i was one of the because like, they <laughs> don't do it anymore yeah, yeah that wasn't a while ago actually yeah but it was one of those things where you you had a topic you wanted to share it and you shared it across a multitude of platforms and a multitude of different places and I thought that's interesting too. I think in a, in a modern sense, we need to be on the channel. We need to be everywhere. And I appreciate you mentioning that I, I conveyed the topic well, because it's, it's hard to do so. So, yeah. No, no, absolutely. And, and to be honest with you, it's, again, I was just putting out content because I just enjoy it and it's kind of fun for me. And, you know, it's like a hobby that turned into a career and then a business essentially. Um, and you'd be surprised how many people approach me through my LinkedIn because they heard me speak on, you know, they heard me speak on something like, hey, can we bring you on board and can you speak to our team about this? Mm -hmm. And and so there, there's also that uh, the monetization piece comes in handy in that. And that wasn't, that's not the, I mean, that's not the intent necessarily, but maybe partially, yes, it, it is maybe for our business, but I didn't expect it to come from that. Like we, we, you know, we produce a lot of content with Bestern and Bloom Youth for the sake of producing content and sharing our knowledge. And like an added benefit of that is then people are now recognizing us as, you know, as experts in this area. And now they're mm -hmm. like, listen, we've heard you. We know you know your stuff. Come and do this for us. You know, so again, you, you're showing people your experience. Like you're showing them what you can do in action. And it's very natural. It's genuine. And it's, you know, it's, it's a proven I don't know, it's credibility. It's credibility. Like this is this is it. This is what we do. It's already out there. We can do the same thing for for your teams and that it works. Reputation, so, so to speak. Reputation, yeah. Yeah. Well, and so speaking of personal brand and, and Bessern and Bloom Youth, where can people find you online? Sure. So um at LinkedIn is where I spend a lot of time. Um so just Elena Agregimova on LinkedIn. Um we have a YouTube as well, which is Bestern. Um, so they can just look up. Uh, we post a lot of content there. Uh, my website, elenaagar.com, um, which is just, yeah, it's just my personal blog. I post a lot of personal stuff there, which might be interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah it's a so, really good blog. I, I've read all the posts on there. It's good. To sh I wanted to talk with you, the shit with me blog series, but we didn't get a chance to today. So maybe next time. Yeah, sure, sure. And so what could be a call to action for the audience today? I would say find ways to be curious about your future. Hmm be curious about your future and find ways to to explore and dig into that curiosity hmm. i mean we've given away some of the, some yeah. of the tips and sure. strategies along the way so little tricks well yeah, and that was a nice tricks. concise short and sweet kind of call to action there i love that and so once again this is dustin and elaine on the polymath polycast thanks for being here thank you it's been a pleasure really same <laughs>